Now we'll take a look at the electron transport chain and the proteins involved. So here we're going to have four different complexes plus that of cytochrome C to discuss. We won't get this all done in one video, uh, but we're going to start off with an overview as well as complex one. These proteins are all in the inner membrane, which means they're all pumping protons from the matrix that is the very center of the mitochondria to the intermembrane space. Besides from these four large complexes that are all embedded in the membrane, there's also going to be a pool of ubiquinone that's going to also be a mobile electron carrier that's going to go through the lipid membrane itself. There's also going to be that protein electron carrier that which is cytochrome C that's going to be going um, in that inner membrane space. Complex two will be familiar to you since it is sexnate dehydrogenase from the TCA cycle. And what's going to happen, we're going to take a look uh, at how these electrons actually flow, because it's not going to go just from one to two to three to four. Uh, it's going to be a little bit more complicated than that. So in general, what happens is electrons are going to be passed from a reaction. So in the case of complex one, that's NADH. In the case of complex two, that's succinate. And those electrons are then going to be transferred to the ubiquinone pool. Once they're in the ubiquinone pool, they're then going to be passed to complex three. Complex three will then pass the electrons to cytochrome C, which finally will pass the electrons to complex four. The end result of going from complex three to cytochrome C to complex four will be the same no matter what. This is just to take a look at how complicated some of these things are. Uh, so what you'll notice in here is, is that you have the different uh, complexes listed and then the number of subunits. Cytochrome C is the only one that only has one, uh, and that complex out of the citric acid cycle only has four, uh, but some of these have a ridiculously large number. We're going to start by looking at complex one, which is that NADH ubiquinone reductase. Before we get to that, since we're trying to tie things back into things like electrochemistry, realize that what's going to happen here is things are going to be passed from one complex to another. As they do that, the reduction potentials for the components are going to increase, which means we're starting off with proteins, we're starting off with complexes that are less likely to be reduced, and we're going to things that are more likely to be reduced. What that means is the electrons are essentially all going downhill. The electrons are continually being passed to things that are more likely to be reduced. So this entire pathway is going to be exergonic. This entire pathway is going to move in that forward direction and is going to do so spontaneously with these electron transfers. Taking another look at this whole system. Uh, so what you'll notice is we do have complex one, complex two, complex three, cytochrome C, and complex four, as we looked at before. There's also two other flavoproteins that can also contribute to that ubiquinone pool. But for us, what I want to focus on is those are those electron transports that we were talking about. So both complex one and complex two are going to feed into the ubiquinone pool, which feed into complex three. Complex three is then going to pass electrons to cytochrome C. Cytochrome C will then pass electrons to complex four. Complex four will finally reduce oxygen to water. So there is that last final electron acceptor, which is going to be oxygen. We've talked about this notion of ubiquinone, and you'll hear me often refer to, refer to this as a, the ubiquinone pool. Realize that ubiquinone is in fact the oxidized form. So ubiquinone then can be reduced to ubiquinol. But in the middle, uh, it also has a semiquinone intermediate. So ubiquinone is really unique in the fact that it can either be a one or two electron carrier. So this is going to be really useful because it, we get a fair amount of power as far as it can carry two electrons, but it can also accept them one at a time. We're going to be dealing with a lot of iron sulfur clusters. Iron sulfur clusters are only going to be able to transport one electron at a time. So ubiquinone is going to be able to accept those electrons one at a time from iron sulfur clusters. So I realize this is also a molecule that has a lot of names. So it is known as co coenzyme Q. Um, so coenzyme Q is that oxidized form. 
So coenzyme Q uh, is the name for the molecule overall, whether it's in the oxidized form or in the reduced form. Uh, ubiquinone then is a more specific term for its oxidized form, ubiquinol being its completely reduced form. You'll hear me overall refer to this as that ubiquinone or ubiquinol as we go through. I'll try to use coenzyme Q just to bring that language back, but I'm used to calling it the that ubiquinone pool. Uh, finally, note that this is a hydrophobic molecule. So even though we are looking at the fact that it's got those carbonyls going to hydroxides, we're like, ooh, look at all the fun hydrogen bonding it could probably participate in. Uh, but realize that it has a really long um, isoprenoid tail, which is going to have it be hydrophobic, which will keep it localized in the membrane. Those are some iron sulfur clusters. So we've mentioned iron sulfur cluster clusters in previous videos. And just remember that these again are gonna take one electron at a time. And usually what you have is a series of them relatively close to each other so that they can pass electrons from one to the other. So your iron sulfur clusters are going to stay locked in place wherever they are in the protein coordinated by cysteine residues. And so since those iron sulfur clusters are gonna remain in place, but those electrons need to move, they're gonna to have to pass them off one to the other. So when you think of these as kind of like baton passes where they need to be close enough where they can kind of reach out and get those electrons to move. So taking a closer look at complex one. Uh, so there's a lot of things going on here. So we're gonna take a look at different parts of this in turn. So starting actually at the bottom, this is gonna take over, this is gonna carry out the electron transfer from NADH all the way to coenzyme Q. So we're gonna make it all the way through. This is therefore called the NADH dehydrogenase um, or the NADH coenzyme Q reductase uh, to notice that it's got both parts in there. Uh, this thing is enormous. Uh, it has about 43 polypeptides, one flavin mononucleotide, that's the FMN located in there, uh, and nine iron sulfur clusters. The first thing that's going to happen down at the bottom is the NADH is going to be oxidized back to NAD when it does that, it's gonna pass those two electrons to FMN, uh, which is one of our flavonoids. Once that FMN then has those electrons, that then is going to pass those electrons into the iron sulfur clusters, where the iron sulfur clusters will then pass electrons one at a time up the chain, uh, essentially acting like a wire inside of this protein, all the way till it gets to coenzyme Q. Uh, coenzyme Q then will accept electrons one at a time from the iron sulfur clusters. So that then coenzyme Q as ubiquinone can get fully reduced uh, with two electrons to ubiquinol. As those electrons are transferred from one iron sulfur cluster to the next, each one of these is gonna have a more positive reduction potential than the last one. So remember that those electrons are being passed in a favorable manner. This is one of my favorite quick quizzes, which is how many electrons can ubiquinone carry? Uh, my favorite answer to this one is that it's complicated. Uh, this is again, just to remind you that oftentimes we're gonna talk about coenzyme Q um, and ubiquinone, that it can carry two, but it does going to do them one at a time. So it is going to have multiple oxidation states. This is again, that notion that the reduction potentials are only gonna get more positive as we proceed. So we're starting off with NADH, and we're going then to FMN. So as we do that, again, we're becoming more positive. Yes, I realize these are all negative values, but they are becoming more positive as we go along. Since our last stop in complex one is actually that coenzyme Q, notice that those reactions, um, those reductions are even higher on the table. So again, our electrons are gonna be proceeding up the table to things that are more easily reduced. So part of the point of this is to have electrons being pumped. So there's going to be a couple of places where we get protons to move in this. Uh, first of all, you are gonna have two protons going from the matrix to ubiquinone. In order for ubiquinone to become ubiquinol, those are going to require one proton each for both sides. So remember that ubiquinone has those two carbonyls. Each carbonyl is gonna to go to a hydroxyl group. So those each require one proton, which is gonna give you a grand total of two for those two electron transfers and those two different groups. So you are gonna have two protons that are gonna go uh, take ubiquinone to ubiquinol. Later, 
when that ubiquinol is reoxidized, those protons are actually going to be released into the inner membrane space. Uh, so those will be contributing to the proton gradient eventually. Then you do also have four protons that are going to be pumped from the matrix to the inner membrane space. So there is energy overall from that oxidation of NADH to NAD+. And that energy released is going to drive a physical change, a conformational change in those helices that's going to then be able to pump those four protons from the matrix to the inner membrane space. So overall, we claim that there's four protons pumped for each two electrons released by NADH. So that one molecule of NADH is going to get us four protons. This is a diagram that's in your book. Uh, it might have been updated by now, but just realize that one thing in here is incorrect, which is that there's no iron sulfur clusters that are in the membrane associated portion of the enzyme. The other thing that's a little bit strange is, is that this one also shows that ubiquinone seeming to be bound to the enzyme like a cofactor. Uh, and again, in general, that ubiquinone is thought to be uh, something that moves in the membrane uh, and is not physically bound to the enzyme. This is giving you guys uh, that view of what our protein looks like. So again, lots of different domains going in here. Um, and then you do have this lovely uh, transmembrane domain that goes throughout everything. Uh, you can kind of see in uh, dark purple one of the helices that actually goes then horizontally across. This is, again, just to get a handle on the fact that there's a lot of different pieces and a lot of different parts of this. So in the membrane domain, you actually have seven different subunits uh, and about 54 transmembrane helices. Uh, so this is a monster of a protein. Uh, you then have eight subunits that are in the hydrophilic domain hanging out in the matrix of the mitochondria. So this is this is a big deal to be able to have this structure. Uh, and so just so you realize that this was in nature, but back in 2014, uh, I know that 2014 seems like a long time ago to all of you, but it's really not. So the fact that this uh, is relatively recent is really pretty cool. Uh, this does actually have information on things like where um, some of those iron sulfur clusters are. It's trying to show off some of the transmembrane domains with all of those helices. Uh, so what you do have when you have part A and part B is part B is just rotated around uh, to try to show you uh, a top-down version of this. Again, this is just one of those things where it's really cool. I would encourage you guys to go look up the paper. Uh, nice thing being college students, you guys have access to university resources. Um, so just pictures are really cool. Um, but here you can actually see the NADH binding site uh, with that special uh, rotation in there. Uh, and again, just the density of how much stuff is going on in this complex. So the proton pumping is pretty cool. So there's a long alpha helix uh, that basically runs along um, a lot of the other helices, and this basically acts somewhat as a piston to help drive the conformational changes that couple those that electron transfer to proton pumping. Uh, so when you look at this, uh, some one of the interesting things is, is that you actually have uh, four protons being pumped, but you base but instead of it being a one proton at a time, you actually have essentially all four of them going at one time. Uh, so this is a big concerted movement all taking place at once in complex one. 